In this series, we're spending time with our SFU research community um, who are engaging and innovating in the area of COVID-19. And I'm really pleased uh, today to be joined by Kelly Lee. Kelly is a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and she's also a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Global Health and Governance. Kelly, it is great to have you with us. Thanks for inviting me, Joy. So Kelly, I'm wondering if you can start off by telling me a little bit about your two studies that have been recently funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Uh, I understand that these studies have been funded through the special call for COVID-19 research. That's right. We've been very fortunate to receive two grants for two studies, and they're very different. So the first study is about strengthening coordination during this pandemic. So what happens is that countries are formally uh, bound by something called the International Health Regulations, which is an international treaty. And what we've seen is that countries are actually not complying very closely with the measures under that treaty. So we wanna know why, and we wanna know what countries are doing uh, in terms of adopting specifically cross-border measures. And those are measures, things like um, trade restrictions, travel restrictions, screening at borders and so on. And we're studying really about what countries are doing, why they've adopted these policies, and maybe we could find ways of encouraging countries to coordinate better as a result. So that's mm -hmm. the first study. And it's, it's something that's maybe a little bit less, um, I guess, immediately interesting to people because coordination sounds a little bit intangible, but it's really fundamental to how well we do in, in fighting this pandemic. The second study is being actually led by my colleague, Dr. Julia Smith, and she is leading a team that's studying how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting on different uh, genders. So um, we're seeing that, for example, that a lot more men than women are, are unfortunately dying from COVID-19. But there are lots of other ways that the outbreak is impacting on populations by gender rather than by sex. So things like um, because women are, are more dis disproportionately represented in uh, healthcare mm -hmm. as carers, perhaps more um, on, uh, you know, hands on in terms of parenting and other sort of impacts that are gendered. This is going to be something really important because when you're uh, adopting sort of measures to fight the pandemic, you want to make sure that you understand those impacts and then, you know, sort of act accordingly. Great. So what's your research telling us so far about the global response to COVID-19? So on cross-border measures, what we've seen is, as I was mentioning, an unprecedented number of countries are actually adopting measures that don't comply with WHO recommendations. So if you think back to the 2014 uh, Ebola outbreak, this was just a few years ago, we found that 25% of countries tended to adopt these cross-border measures that didn't comply. But now what we're seeing is almost every country has adopted these measures. So we're not saying they're not um, effective. In fact, we don't really know uh, enough about how effective they are, but we're finding that these measures are being adopted more and we need to know why, um, what impact they're having, and then maybe you know, what impact on coordination. So that's the first project. And the second project, uh, what it's telling us is that these differential impacts are actually not studied very often by uh, people who make decisions. So these gendered impacts are actually not even on the radar oftentimes when people are putting together uh, COVID um, response mechanisms. And, but we know that they are having impacts. So the study is trying to gather that data that isn't there and then to address any of these differential impacts. So you can't address a problem unless you measure it, of course. And so we're gonna start with measuring the problem and then we're gonna try and make recommendations on how gender can be less impacted by this outbreak. Great. So I just wanna follow up on the WHO. Um, there's been a lot in the news recently about um, people's opinions about how the WHO is performing, et cetera. But I'm wondering if you can um, uh, tell me a little bit more about what the WHO's role is in a global pandemic such as COVID-19. Yes, WHO is uh, formerly the UN Specialized Agency for Health. And what that means is that it's the designated international organization that coordinates uh, cooperation across countries when it comes to health issues such as a pandemic. So it has a formal role in that sense, but that doesn't mean it does everything. So it's, it's an organization that has a certain mandate. So when it comes to outbreaks, 
what it does, first of all, is it gathers intelligence. So it's called epidemic intelligence and it gathers information from all member states, there are 194 of them, and information is fed from governments up to WHO, and they assemble that information and feed out, you know, reports that an event has occurred, countries should be you know, taking note, making preparations, and so on. So it alerts countries to what it should do, and also it gives advice about what can be done specifically. So that's the core things when it comes to a pandemic. I think there's a lot of expectations about WHO doing a lot more. And that's actually beyond um, the mandate of WHO, but also its resources. We haven't actually given WHO much money. So beyond, you know, uh, alerting countries and giving technical advice, which is really critical, um, what it cannot do is, you know, have boots on the ground. It can't go in and, um, you know, provide health care, for example. That's up to our governments to do that. We have uh, health care systems in each country. And then governments are supposed to then swing into action once they get the best advice from WHO. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think we're all realizing that pandemics don't know borders. And so this notion of coordination is really important. And I'm wondering if you could um, say a little bit more about the factors that really are impeding um, coordination um, across countries. Yeah, there are many factors. And we're trying to understand, you know, why is it that the international health regulations haven't been um, as front and center as it, it was supposed to be. It was renegotiated after the SARS uh, outbreak and we thought we had a system where countries could coordinate together. I think part of it is, um, well, part of it is undoubtedly political. There's all sorts of um, high politics going on at the moment. And, you know, the US and China specifically are having not the best time in terms of um, international relations. So I think that kind of muddies things. But the, the other side of it is I think that coordination, coordination is undermined by not building the systems ahead of a pandemic. So not waiting until a pandemic occurs and everybody scrambles around, but actually building both national level and global level public health systems so that we're prepared. And this is something we've been warned about for you know, years, if not decades, to spend more money on, on WHO's capacities on our own capacities, but also capacities in, in particularly the developing world where there are, you know, real weaknesses in, in um, detecting outbreaks in lab facilities and so on. So really basic core capacities. We haven't invested nearly enough. Um, the call went out every time we have a public health emergency, a call goes out for funding and, and very little comes back. So, you know, when you, when you have a big outbreak like this, and this is, this really is unprecedented, uh, for sure, and who could be prepared for something that you know that's so big, but we could have been better prepared. And because we haven't invested, uh, we're, we are you know finding ourselves in a really difficult situation. And it's interesting, um, just as follow up, we did learn lessons from, for example, the SARS outbreak and other outbreaks. And it does seem that we're going to also, through research such as yours, also gain new understandings about potentially how we we can handle these outbreaks in the future. For sure. I mean, we're learning a lot that, you know, we need to invest uh, more. We need to plan better. We need to maybe uh, conduct scenarios, um, the preparedness scenarios, which, you know, we have the, actually the, the know-how to do these things. We do them in other spheres of our lives, uh, in security planning, for example, in, you know, all sorts of terrorist um, anticipation of terrorist attacks. You know, these kind of exercises are, are used a lot in other spheres of policy. So I think we could use them more effectively in global health. And that way we can anticipate, you know, what do we need to invest in? Who do we need to invest in? And then next time, and there will be a next time, unfortunately, Joy, um, then we'll be better prepared, better coordinated, and hopefully have a better outcome than what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'm wondering about, I know um, another area of your research is in tobacco control, tobacco research. And I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit uh, about what your research is indicating about uh, the severity of COVID-19, particularly those who, for those who smoke or vape. Yes, this is something really important that people have to understand. So a major focus of my research over the past 25 years has actually been on tobacco control. So I've had sort of two streams of my research. And um, there's still a lot that we don't know about COVID-19, about this novel virus, because it is novel. But we do know that there seems to be a connection between 
um, COVID-19 and smoking or vaping. And there's three ways that actually they're connected. The first is that if, if you do become infected with the coronavirus, you're much more likely to develop a severe case of COVID-19 if you smoke or vape. And this is perhaps not surprising because we know that smoking and vaping is really bad on your lungs. It compromises your lung function. It destroys the, the lining of your lungs in ways that impairs uh, respiratory function. So if you are being infected with an illness that attacks your lungs, this puts you in a very difficult situation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that actually smoking and vaping weakens your immune system. So it makes you more prone to become infected from coronavirus. And this is something that, again, um, people are studying and, and noting that as well. And the third reason that it's linked is because there's a greater risk of infection because of the way that smoking and vaping is um, moves your hands between um, you know, the, the, the environment that you're in to your face. So you're lifting a cigarette to your face, to your mouth, and that can increase the risk of infection as well. So, so people are saying, you know, this is the best time to quit. This is the best time to at least quit, even if it not temporarily, permanently, because you're then increasing your chances of not getting the virus and then surviving if you if you do get it. It's interesting, you know, I hadn't really thought about all those three factors and how they potentially could um, develop um, or make one more susceptible um, to the virus. That's fascinating. So what do you think the, that government um, public health officials can do right now to help people who are smoking and vaping to, to, cur to curb the habit um, and to potentially make them less susceptible? Well, the, we know that prevention is always better than cure. This is a basic public health um, principle. So I think what the government could do is, first of all, get the message out that they, there is this link uh, at a, a really important time when we're all trying to stay healthy. But they could, they could do a bit more. They could probably make available to people who are trying to quit, and I hope that's everyone, um, the, the, the means to do so. So we have, um, in here in BC, we're lucky to have the BC Smoking Cessation Program, which helps some people um, get access to things like nicotine replacement therapy, things like that, pharmaceutical products. If the government could make that easier, I mean, there are you know, restrictions on who can apply for those uh, products for how long if the government could make those more readily available, I think that would help a lot of people to make the decision that this is a good time to, to quit smoking and vaping, uh, making those products available. We know it's very difficult to quit. Uh, for some people, you know, it's a real struggle. So this would help a little bit. And I think the government would probably reap real benefits from having less people, um, you know, likely to, to be um, needing healthcare services, which is what we want. We want to flatten that curve. Uh, but we also know that will help them in the long run because they'll have better um, better health. You know, that's such an important message, I think, uh, particularly uh, given the fact that it looks like um, this virus might be with us for a while. And um, so there's obviously some key things that people can do to um, prevent their um, development of serious symptoms. So thanks for that. That's really interesting. I'm wondering um, if you, uh, you know, in summary, want to just comment on really what you hope to achieve. You know, where is this research leading, um, Kelly? What do you hope to achieve with it? Yes, the, the two projects I think are, you know, they are very different, but I think there's some, some ways connected as well. Uh, we're really overall trying to improve health, health outcomes from this outbreak and hopefully future outbreaks by being more prepared, you know, being more, um, you know, anticipating the kind of impacts that they have. So, you know, it's, it'll, what we're trying to do is put forward um, clear frameworks for better coordination and also for dealing with gender, which is something that again gets, you know, left off so often. Um, and in, in part of that, I guess, is to get people to think about global health as an investment and that we need to think about them just as hard as we think about other policy areas. So I, I say to my students, you know, we've really, um, when we're, we think about globalization, we think, well, we've put a lot of effort into making our economies globalized, interconnected, and, and a lot of legal frameworks around that. But at the same time, we haven't given enough attention to, to health, which everybody now realizes is actually even more important, <laughs> if not you know, equally important. So we have to put those same um, investments, those same efforts to create legal frameworks, to create uh, capacities. And, and so our research is trying to show that, and we're trying to inform policymakers that these are the sorts of things that they need to prioritize and how they could do that. 
Um, so I, I'm hoping that, you know, we can move from being sort of academic research to more practical applied uh, lessons for, for going forward. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. You know, it, it just seems so apt to that we have um, referred to this series as change makers because that's ultimately what you're wanting to do is create change and improve our systems. I really want to thank you for joining me today. And uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. And I want to encourage our viewers to stay tuned and tune into our next week's episode when we're going to interview another change maker addressing COVID-19. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joy.